This lesson deals with the Operational Amplifier, or Op-Amp for short. You can find these notes in the ECE 201 eBook in Chapter 4, starting on page 18. What we'll be looking at in this section of the course is an integrated circuit called the Operational Amplifier. Take a look at its definitions and how it relates to the controlled sources that we've been studying about. You can buy an integrated circuit at most electronic parts stores called an Op-Amp. It typically has five terminals, a positive input, a negative input, an output, a positive power supply, and a negative power supply. What this means is that to get this thing to work, you need to apply a positive battery to this pin and a negative battery to this pin. Current comes out of this power supply and into the IC, and it comes back out again. So we're generating power from VCC, and we're also generating power from minus VCC. Because of all the connections here, it's not as convenient to leave off showing the connections to the power supply. But you have to remember that that's still there. So just using the three terminals that we have, and again, this is an output and an input with respect to the ground of the power supplies. If we were to plot the voltage here versus the difference of the voltage on the input terminals, you get a graph that looks like this. So on the x-axis, the difference of the positive terminal minus the negative terminal, and then plotting the output voltage here. So when we're operating in this region, we're operating as a linear element. The ratio of the output to the input is a constant. Since there's a voltage out over voltage in, this will be represented by a voltage controlled voltage source. And the slope here is actually our value of mu. We'll be able to go up to this voltage at best and likewise down to this voltage. In a real IC, you'll find that this is a little bit short of the positive power supply and a little bit short of the negative power supply. In this region, we have a linear element, and we actually have a linear element here and here, but it's in a sense piecewise linear, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later in this chapter. In this linear region, we have an output voltage that's dependent on the difference of the input voltages times the scale factor mu. Now, when you apply a difference of voltage across these pins, a current will flow, and you effectively get some resistance. Basically, what we have here is a Thevenin equivalent circuit on the output, and in some sense, you have a Thevenin equivalent circuit on the input, just that our Thevenin voltage is equal to zero. Use this as a model for our uh, operational amplifier. In commercial op amps, the value of R sub i here is very, very large. In many cases, it's between 1 million and 1 tera ohms. In other words, 10 to the 6th and 10 to the 12th ohms. The output resistance here is actually quite low, somewhere between 10 ohms and 100 ohms for, for many commercial op amps. And lastly, this scale factor here, mu, is sometimes between 100k and 100 million. Now, if you look at these numbers long enough, you can start to ask yourself a question is, if you have the perfect op amp, where are these numbers heading towards? Well, the input resistance is really very large, and in the limit, if it were perfect, it would be infinite. The output resistance is low, and in the limit, it would be zero if it were perfect. But lastly here are the gain. This gain mu, if it's as large as this, we could say it's tending towards infinity. So let's define an ideal op amp with these parameters. Now we know how to represent zero resistance, that's a short circuit, and infinite resistance, that's an open circuit. But what do you do about infinite gain? Well, let's see how we might handle this. Let's replace the resistances Ri and R0 by their ideal values. An open circuit here and a short circuit here. But what I've got now is this controlled source with a very, very large gain, and the limit, say, infinite. Let's do an example and see how we might be able to handle this value of mu approaching infinity. So here I've got an op amp. Okay, I'm not going to show the power supply connections. We're going to assume that you're going to make those. And what this is saying with the power supply is that there is a controlled source from back through here back to ground. That's what this is really saying back over here. So although we're showing three terminals here, there is a fourth terminal. That's the ground of the power supply. Let's see if we could solve for V out divided by V sub S. We'll assume that R1 and R2 are known resistances and that V sub S would also be known. The output would be in terms of those three things. But because it's a linear circuit, the ratio of V out to V sub S doesn't depend on having a specific value here. One approach to analyzing this is to replace the op amp symbol by this model that we have here at the top of the page. So between the plus and minus terminals, we have an open circuit. And from the output terminal back to ground, we've got a voltage-controlled voltage source. What we could do is analyze the circuit and do what we do in calculus, and that is to take a limit as something approaches, in this case, infinity. So what's V out? V out is just the controlled source here, mu times V sub x. And what's the voltage V sub x? Well, it's the positive pin minus the 
negative pin. I'll call it V sub P and V sub N. Also, this is equal to V sub S. This node, V sub S minus V sub N times mu would be the voltage here, which is the output voltage. I have the output in terms of the input, but also one of these other internal node voltages. So I need to get rid of this variable. So what is the voltage here? Well, the current in R2 is the same as R1. So I could use the voltage divider rule. When two resistances share the same current, and you know the voltage across them, then the voltage across one resistance is just simply that resistance over the sum of the two times the voltage applied here. Let me do it in terms of V out. So now I can have V out in terms of V sub S and V out. Substitute this back over here on the next page. So V out is equal to mu times V sub S minus V sub N, which is V out R1 over R1 plus R2. Let's put this on the other side of the equation. So I've got V out times one, and then I've got V out times mu R1 or R1 plus R2, and then I've got mu times V sub S. So I can solve for V out divided by V sub S. So bring this term back over here. So I've got mu and then divided by one plus mu R1 over R1 plus R2. Now normally you would just stop here, evaluate this equation given a value of mu, if it say we're finite. Let me do some factoring here to show you when I take the limit, some interesting characteristics. So let me pull out a factor of R1 over R1 plus R2. So I have a leftover as mu here. Now since I have a one here, I'm gonna to have to take the reciprocal of this. So when I multiply it, I'll get a one here. Right, so I'll have R1 plus R2 over R1. And again, if you multiply this through, this will cancel and this will cancel and you get one plus mu times this. All right, now take the reciprocal of that and you get R1 plus R2 over R1. Let me bring also mu into the denominator. So multiply the numerator and denominator by one over mu. So this becomes one and I'm gonna multiply this by one over mu and this by one over mu. Now if you take the limit as mu goes to infinity, then this term will be divided by a huge number. What that means then is that this term will drop out. We just simply have the term here in front, R1 plus R2 over R1. You could also divide this in and get one plus R2 over R1. So the voltage gain of this circuit if the amplifier that's inside this integrated circuit has a very, very large gain, the output voltage depends only on a resistor ratio plus one times V sub S. In a transistor course, we'll see that it's very easy to put together lots of stages of amplifiers to create big gains. One of the problems we're gonna run into is that they're very temperature sensitive. In this particular derivation here, mu can be a number that's very large, but even varying. As long as it's large, this term will drop out. This is the advantage of this configuration of feedback is that it only depends on a resistor ratio and can be chosen very stable with temperature. Or if they vary in temperature by the same factor, that temperature factor drops out. This particular circuit is called a non-inverting amplifier. I'll explain where that word comes from once we take a look at another circuit called an inverting amplifier. Taking the limit as mu goes to infinity is really a technique we would use based on calculus, but is there an easier way to deal with this kind of a problem? Let's take a look at an idea of trying to simplify the work we just did. I'm gonna call this the zero volt, zero current property of ideal op amps. Now in solving for V out or V sub S, we derived the equations with the control source and then took the limit as mu went to infinity. Suppose that we did that a couple steps earlier. In other words, V out is equal to mu times V sub X. And so V sub X is V out divided by mu. If you take the limit as mu goes to infinity, then this term approaches zero if V out is finite. That might sound kind of silly, but there is a condition called stability where the output actually tries to run away to infinity. Let's assume that we're operating a circuit that actually is stable. And if that's true, then this is finite, then V sub X is gonna approach zero as mu approaches infinity. Now the currents that are coming into the input terminals of an op amp are very small because R sub I is huge. And in the limit, it's an open circuit. So we have no current entering the plus or minus terminal. And what this is saying here is that V sub X is approaching zero. This is happening because of the feedback in the circuit. The output's telling the input to shrink because the output is equal to mu times V sub X. And what I've got then is a very big number times a very small number giving me finite output. Could show this on the schematic drawing got no current coming in or going out of these terminals because they have a very high resistance. The voltage here is, we'll say driven to zero by the fact that the output here needs to be mu times V sub X and if V out is finite, then V sub X has to shrink to zero. You can also show that here with really infinity times zero. If 
you recall in calculus, zero times infinity is indeterminate. It can be any number it needs to be. What's going to happen is that this is going to be determined by the things we hook up around the op amp. So here I've got a voltage source, although it's a dependent voltage source. The current coming in here or out of here is just unspecified. There is no relationship. And the controlling source variable, which is also arbitrary. So here you actually have arbitrary voltage and you have an arbitrary current. In circuit theory, there's a name for this, and we'll put that off to a later course. Just to make one comment, this driven to zero here does require some form of feedback between the output and the input. Without that, the input across the op amp won't know to shrink. So we're going to assume that we're operating in a stable feedback circuit when we do our op amp calculations. And in EC202, we'll take a look at what's needed for a circuit to be stable. This representation on the op amp, we're labeling no voltage and no current. Well, if you have no voltage, that's a short circuit. If you have no current, that's an open circuit. So the voltage across and the current through the input of the op amps are looking like an open circuit and a short circuit simultaneously. We haven't seen a symbol for doing that. There is one in circuit theory, but again, I'll lead this to a course in, in just that topic. So what we're going to do is just label on the schematic the no voltage, no current condition or property of the ideal op amp. We're just going to do Kirchhoff's laws around those particular labelings. Just some of the properties of the operational amplifier. 